Hi, my name is Sebastian Matteau. I'm the lead developer of Open Sesame. And today we're going to walk through the step-by-step -step tutorial for Open Sesame 3.0. Before we start with the tutorial, a little bit about Open Sesame. Open Sesame is a uh, program mostly for researchers, uh, psychologists, neuroscientists, uh, experimental economists to create behavioral experiments. So it's a very user-friendly graphical interface for creating uh, behavioral experiments. Open Sesame is cross-platform, so it runs on Windows, which is what we're going to use today. Uh, it runs on Mac OS, it runs on Linux, and a runtime-only version runs on Android, the mobile operating system. Open Sesame is open source, which means that you can uh, download and use the software for free with very uh, few license restrictions, and also that you can download and modify the source code if you, uh, if you would be so inclined. Before we start with the tutorial again, let's take a look at the user interface. Open Sesame has a menu bar here at the, at the top, which has standard functionality like starting a new uh, experiment, opening a file, saving a file, etc. Below the menu bar we have the main toolbar, which is, uh, which is a selection of the most relevant information from the menu bar, basically. It allows you to start a new experiment, open an existing experiment, save an experiment, uh, various ways of running an experiment. Uh, it allows you to close uh, tabs. So we have a tab area here which can, uh, in which you can have multiple tabs open. If it gets a bit messy you can click on this button to close all tabs except the one that you're currently viewing. Uh, you can enable so-called one tab mode in which only one tab is visible at a time. Uh, and here you can uh, hide or view various uh, aspects of the Open Sesame user interface which we will meet later on in this tutorial and you can undo and uh, redo uh, things, uh, redo actions uh, uh, once you get to work. Now on the left side here we have the item toolbar. Items are the, the building blocks of experiments in Open Sesame. so an experiment is basically a collection, a structure of, uh, of items and you can uh, add items to your experiment by dragging them from here so up, picking them up and dragging them up like that into your experiment which we will do uh, later in this tutorial. Uh, then here we have the overview area which provides a graphical tree-like overview uh, of uh, your experiment structure which is very useful. Uh, then here we have the so-called tab area which shows uh, which is kind of like a browser which shows the graphical controls of your items uh, which shows uh, messages etc. Uh, you will do most of the work in Open Sesame here in this uh, tab area usually. Below we have the debug window, which is a, a Python interpreter. Now Python is a is a very high level uh, programming language, which is used a lot in uh, in science for scientific purposes, and you can also use it in Open Sesame. We are not going to use Python uh, in our tutorial today, so this debug window is not very useful to us. So we hide it by clicking here on this ladybug icon, so we have a little bit uh, more uh, room on the screen. Okay, now, um, let's take a look at the tutorial that we're going to do today. It is this tutorial, the so-called step-by-step tutorial, or the beginner tutorial, which you can find uh, here on this, uh, this address, on the, the, uh, op the, on the Open Sesame documentation site. Uh, and in, uh, this is a step-by-step -step tutorial. It consists of 13 steps, really from the start, from a completely blank experiment to a full functioning uh, gaze queuing experiment. Now, uh, the experiment that we're going to, to create is a gaze queuing experiment and it has the following structure. Every trial starts with a fixation dot, so a small dot in the center of the screen. This fixation dot is followed by a so-called neutral gaze queue, so a, a smiley that looks on straight at you from the center of the screen. This is followed by a gaze queue, so it's a smiley that looks either to the left or the right side of the screen. And this is in turn followed by a target and a distractor while the gaze queue is still visible on the screen. So uh, the, the distractor is always the letter X, which uh, means nothing to the participant. And the target is the letter F or H. And the participant's task is to indicate whether they saw an F by pressing the Z key on the keyboard with their left hand or the H by pressing the M key on the keyboard 
with their right hand. So it's basically an arbitrary response mapping. Uh, if the participant makes a mistake, so if the, if the participant doesn't provide the response or provides the wrong response, we will play a, uh, a sound uh, to to provide some uh, some feedback. Okay, uh, now let's switch back to Open Sesame. Here we click on Open Sesame. When you start Open Sesame for the first time, you you receive this kind of uh, welcome message, uh, which we can close for now. So I click on the close tab button. And then we, with, without further ado, we can start with uh, step one of the experiment, in, we're, in which we're going to define the main sequence of our uh, experiment. Now, when you start Open Sesame, you see that it by default loads uh, the so-called default template, which is a sequence called experiment, consisting of a notepad called start, getting started, and a sketchpad called welcome. Now, a sequence is a special type of item in Open Sesame that runs other items sequentially, as the name uh, suggests, of course. Um, in this case, we don't need the two items that are already there, the getting started notepad and the welcome sketchpad. So you can say right click, delete, right click, delete. Uh, and now we have an empty sequence to start from. Okay? You will see that the actual the items that we've deleted are still visible in the unused item bin unused items bin until we say permanently delete unused items yes okay switch back to the experiment sequence okay now um, the main sequence of our experiment is basically the most high level sequence uh, the most high level structure of our experiment which really defines that we start with this instruction screen which is followed by uh, several blocks of practice trials which is followed by another screen that lets the participant know that uh, the practice phase is finished which is followed by several blocks of experimental trials right uh, which is in the end finished by a, a message that lets the participant know that the experiment is finished now um, if you are if you've printed out the tutorial or if you're viewing it online you will see uh, the structure that we're going to create in figure 5 uh, so it may be convenient for reference to have that uh, by, by hand. Okay, and we're going to start, as I said, with an instruction screen. And for that, we're going to use this item, the text form underscore text display item. So we're going to pick it up and drag it whoop, into our experiment. Okay, there we have it. We are not going to bother with uh, adjusting the, the text now. We can do that later. We're just going to give it a good name. That's important because if you don't, if you just always stick with the default names, you get very confusing uh, structures. So it's really important to give informative names to your items. So this one is called instructions. Okay. So you can rename items by either clicking here in the tab area or by right clicking on the item here in the tree in the overview area and selecting rename. It's the same thing. After the instructions, we have a loop. Okay, we add that into the experiment. And this loop, uh, a loop is, a, is an item, again, like the sequence, it's an item that adds structure to your experiment. And what the loop does is it runs another item repeatedly. Right, so it, it has a single other item that it runs repeatedly. And in our case, this loop runs a block repeatedly. So our practice loop, we're going to rename it to practice loop runs a practice block repeatedly. Now, then, of course, we also need a practice block. For this, we're going to use a sequence. We pick it up and we drag it onto our practice loop item, drop it. Then the Open Sesame asks if we want to set the new item as the item to run for the practice loop. So basically, if we want to add the sequence into the practice loop, or if we want to insert it after the practice loop. So we want to add it into, set it in the practice loop, Up, like this. Then we have a new sequence, which we're going to call block sequence. Now, working with, with loops and sequences is, and using those to create, to add structure to your experiment is one of the, one of the, one of the key things uh, that you need to, to know in order to work with Open Sesame. It sounds a bit abstract in the beginning, but 
if you do it, if, you, if you've seen it a few times, you will understand the general logic. So basically, the logic here is that this block sequence corresponds to one block of trials, uh, and the practice loop around it runs this one block of trials multiple times, so that our practice phase can consist of multiple blocks. Okay. Uh, now, after the practice uh, practice phase, we need another text message, so we're going to use another form text display. We drag it to the end of our experiment sequence. Again, uh, OpenSesame asks us if we want to add a new item into the practice loop, which we don't want to do, right? We want to add it after the practice loop. Oop. So now we have our new form text display here, and we're going to rename it into end of practice, because it's the message that the participant will see when the practice phase is over. After this, we will have another loop, which we will call experimental loop. Experimental loop. Right? And this is the loop that's going to loop over blocks of trials during the experimental phase of our experiment. Right? So after the training, once the participants are doing the real experiment. Uh, and again, we need another item to loop over. And we're going to reuse this block sequence. So the idea here is that the idea is that uh, the experiment, basically the, the the blocks and the trials of our experiment, are exactly the same during the practice phase and the experimental phase of our of our, uh, of our experiment. So we don't need to redefine everything twice. We can simply reuse this block sequence that we've already created. Now, to do that, we don't drag a new item into it. Instead. We select an already existing item from this drop-down menu, select block sequence, and now you will see that the same block sequence is part of both experimental loop and practice loop. And these are what we call uh, linked copies. So everything you do to this block sequence will also apply to this block sequence and vice versa. It's really the same item that occurs in two different places of the experiment. Okay, and that's quite convenient because it avoids you from having to do everything twice. And then at the end of the experiment, uh, we add, again add a uh, add a text display item. Well, it, you can, as I s said, you can add uh, items by dragging them from the item toolbar. Another way to add items is to open the sequence by clicking on it and doing this: add, append new item, select form display, form text display. And then we say, oh, rename, end of experiment. Right, so do, using this plus button to add a new item is exactly the same thing as dragging a new item from the item toolbar into here or from the item toolbar into here. It all boils down to the same thing. Uh, okay, well, that's the end of uh, step one. So now we have the basic structure of our experiment uh, laid out. Um, and in step two, we're going to create the block sequence. So we're going to define one block of trials uh, from the top down, not yet bothering with individual trials, but just the general block sequence. So I click on block sequence. Now, each block of trials starts by resetting uh, the feedback variables. Right? Auto Open Sesame automatically maintains an average response time uh, and an average accuracy, or not an average accuracy, but an accurate accuracy. And if we don't reset those, then they will just keep accumulating over the during the entire experiment. But that's not usually what we want. Usually we want to give feedback just on a particular block of trials. Uh, and to do that, we need to reset the feedback variables at the beginning of the block. Click on plus, append new item, and we're going to select uh, reset feedback. Up, see, easy peasy. Um, right click, rename, and just say reset feedback. Oh, reset feedback. Okay. Now, um, after we've reset it, if you can say that feedback, uh, we're going to loop across the actual trials. So for that, we need another loop. We're going to drag that into the block sequence, right? And this loop will repeat one trial multiple times. So we can rename it to uh, block loop. 
and one trial is a sequence that is part of this block loop. So we add it onto the block loop. Up. Set this item to run for block loop. Get that space. Rename block sequence. Oh, sorry, this is not correct actually. It is trial sequence. Yes. So we have one trial that is executed multiple times by a block loop, right? Uh, and then our block sequence is followed by a feedback item. Okay, which we rename to feedback. Now, I've been on purpose using different ways of interacting with the user interface, right? You can drag items from here into your experiment. You can use this plus button. You can drag items into, into the overview area or into the controls of the, of the sequence. It all works. It all has more or less the same effect, right? It just does what you expect it to do, namely modify the structure of your experiment. Okay. Um, okay, so now we have the basic... Now we have gone further, we've gone deeper in in, the, in uh, specifying the basic structure of our experiment, right? So from the top down we have an experiment sequence which runs an instruction screen, which runs a practice loop, and the practice loop multiple times runs a block sequence which corresponds to one block of trials. In a block of trials we start by resetting the feedback, then we run we run the block loop which runs a trial trial sequence multiple times. Once that's finished we provide feedback at the end of the block. Okay. Then we jump back up in the hierarchy. After the practice phase is finished we give a message that the practice phase is finished to the, to the participant. Then we start with the experimental loop, so the experimental phase of the experiment, uh, which again consists of multiple trials, each trial consisting corresponding to a block sequence. Uh, and of course it's the same block sequence so we start by resetting feedback looping across mul over multiple trials providing feedback and then at the very end of the experiment we jump back up into the hierarchy and we provide an end of experiment message okay so uh, the general structure of the experiment it's quite hierarchical but it's it's actually not uh, not not terribly complicated okay now we're going to uh, define the independent variables in our experiment. So we are at the end of step 2 and we're going to start with step 3. And we're going to define our independent variables in the block loop. So click on the block loop up to open it. You see that we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, items open here. This can be a little bit confusing. So you can say, okay, I want to close all other items. Or you can say, okay, I want to enable one tab mode. In which case, uh, there are you can only have one tab open at a time. I personally kind of like uh, one tab mode. So let's enable that. Okay, so here we have the block loop. Uh, in the block loop uh, you can define a, a table with your independent variables here, which is now completely empty. Uh, but if you have a full factorial design, and we, we do have a full factorial design uh, in this uh, tutorial, you can use the variable wizard, just to, to save a little bit of time. We almost have a full factorial design anyway. Uh, so click click on the variable wizard. Okay. Um, and the variable wizard works as follows. On the first row, you type the names of all the independent variables e that exist in your experiment. So we have, for example, the variable gaze Q, which determines whether our smiley face is going to look to the left or the right. So below the name, we give the possible values of our variable, so that's left and right. Okay, right. So we have a variable gaze Q, which can be either left or right. Then our other variable is the position of the target, target position. Right. The target can also occur, be presented on the left or the right side of the screen. Um, now we could type left or right. But to make our life a little bit easier, what we're going to do is directly specify the position of the target in pixels relative to the center. So in Open Sesame, 0, 0 is always the, the, the center of the display. So if, the, if we use minus 300 for the x-coordinate of the target, this means it will be, be shown to the left, 300 pixels to the left of the center. And 
on other trials we show it to the right of the center so it's 300 right so basically this means the same thing as left and, and right but it's a little bit you will see that it's a little bit easier to specify it this way uh, later on in the tutorial then we have the the, the target letter right and uh, which is an F or an H okay so what we have here is a 2 by 2 by 2 design right so we have three factors all of which have three factors here all of which have two levels okay. click on OK you will see that open sesame uh, automatically generates a table where each column corresponds to a uh, variable and each row corresponds to uh, to a cycle and in our case a cycle is a trial right so for example in cycle one uh, the target would be on the left the gaze would also look to the left and the targets would be an F uh, and these are all these different cycles are walked through in random order right so it's a randomized uh, randomized uh, trial sequence well block it's a randomized block okay um, now we're not completely done yet because obviously in addition to the target we also have a distractor which also has a position we can use some clever deduction well not even that clever we can use some fairly basic deduction to just program programmatically say that whenever the the, the distractor is a, is whenever the target is on the left the distractor is on the right but for our purpose that's even a little bit too complicated so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new variable called dist pause for distractor position okay and whenever target position is 300 distractor position will be minus 300 so select this copy paste right a little bit of copy pasting will will save us a bit of time copy up, paste right so the basically the distractor is always on the opposite side from the target uh, we are also going to define the variable called correct response uh, and this variable is automatically recognized by open sesame uh, and used to determine whether the participants give the correct response or not so it's uh, it's quite convenient to define a correct response uh, by uh, to to sort of give keep tra track of accuracy across uh, across uh, uh, across the blocks of tr blocks of trials now uh, our response rule was such that whenever the target was an F the correct response was a Z and whenever the target was an H the correct response was an M right this is just completely arbitrary but that's what we've chosen so we're going to do paste okay up paste up okay now there we have a fully uh, a fully uh, finished block loop in which we've defined all the independent independent variables uh, of our experiment okay so that brings us to the end of step three uh, now we're moving on to step four in which we're going to add images and sound files to the open sesame file pool what is the file pool? The file pool, you, let's first make the file pool visible by clicking on this item here, uh, this icon here. Click up. And there we have the file pool, which is now empty. The file pool is just a collection of a, a collection of files that are part of your experiment and that are also automatically saved along with your experiment. So you never have to sort of walk around with a USB stick with your experiment file and all kinds of separate bitmaps and whatever. Just, just put them in your file pool and they're automatically bundled uh, with Open Sesame. Now the, the 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 files that we need for our experiment are available online, so we can switch back to the to to the internet browser, and then we we, we go down up, up, okay, and in step four, add images and sound files to the file pool. We click on it. That's where we are now, and here you see that we have three bit bitmaps: gaze neutral, gaze left, and gaze right. And we have one sound file that we're going to play back when participants give the incorrect response. Okay, so okay, save as. Just going to save it in the downloads folder. Up, save, save as, save as, save as. Okay, now we've downloaded the files. Uh, to add them to the Open Sesame file pool, you can just uh, view the files in uh, in uh, Explorer or whatever kind of file browser you use. You select them and you drag them up into uh, Open Sesame. Right. So there we go. Now we've added uh, added those four files to our file pool. Uh, 
and we can use them in our experiment. Obviously, you can also use files in your experiment that are not part of the file pool. Uh, for example, if you're using very large video files, it's usually not convenient to add them to the file pool. But in most cases, it's uh, adding your files to the file pool is the most is the easiest way to use files in OpenSesame. Okay. Um, well, that brings us to the end of uh, step four. Now we're going to move on to step five, in which things get a little bit uh, more interesting. We're going to define our trial sequence. So we're going to add items to our trial sequence. Now, um, each trial starts with a fixation dot, and a fixation dot is a sketchpad. Okay? The sketchpad is this item right here, and the sketchpad is just the, 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 the normal way to present visual stimuli in OpenSesame. There are multiple ways to present visual stimuli. For example, we've already seen the, the form text display to present text. Uh, but that's quite specific for if you want to have more or less uh, questionnaire or form-based interaction with the user. If you just want to show things on the screen, then you want to use the sketchpad item. Okay, so we're going to add that to our trial sequence. Um, and we're going to rename it to uh, fixation dot. Right? So we're always going to rename our items just so that we know what they mean. Uh, that makes our life a lot easier. Okay, after the fixation dot, we have the neutral case, right? The part of the experiment where the smiley looks at us. So we drag a new sketchpad and we rename it to neutral case. Um, and after the neutral gaze, we have the gaze cue, so the part of the trial where the smiley looks to the left or the right. Yep. Rename it gaze cue. And then after the gaze cue, we have the target. Right? So part of the trial where the gaze cue is still pre present, but there's also the distractor and the target letter. Yep. So rename target. Um, after we've shown the target, we want to collect a keyboard response. For that, we're going to use the keyboard response item right here. So we're going to drag that into the experiment. Can rename it to keyboard response. After the keyboard response, we're going to play a sound if the response was incorrect. Now, to play sounds, we have two items. We have the samplers, the, like the wooden box here. The sampler plays sound files. And we have the synth, which plays synthesized sounds, right? So it beeps, etc. It's a very basic uh, sound synthesizer. We are going to use the sampler item, right? Because we have a sound file. So we're going to pick that up, drag it into the experiment. Now, obviously, we don't always want to play a sound, right? We're going to rename this, by the way, to incorrect sound. Um, yes, we don't always want to play the sound. And to control that, we can use this run if column. So here on the, we have the item names, right? And we have all the run if statements. So we always show fixation, not always neutral gaze, always the gaze queue, always the target, always the keyboard response, but not always the incorrect sound. So edit the run if statement. And we're going to type the following. Correct is 1. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, the square brackets around correct mean that correct is the name of a variable. Um, and the equals 1 means that the incorrect sound, uh, the incorrect sound uh, sampler is only played if the correct variable has the value 1, which, come to think of it, is of course not correct. It should be correct is 0. So basically what this means is if the participant gives an incorrect response, the, if that happens, autom Open Sesame automatically sets the variable correct to zero. And in that case, we play the incorrect sound sampler. Okay. So uh, using these kind of uh, run if statements, you can, you can control the flow of your, uh, of your, uh, of your experiment uh, quite easily in a quite flexible and powerful way. You can learn much more about using if statements uh, online uh, on the documentation side. Okay, now 
at the very end of the experiment, we're going to do something which we should never forget. We're going to log the data. So Open Sesame doesn't automatically log the data. To, to log data, you need the logger item. So we're going to pick up the logger item and drag it up here and come to rename it. We will get back to the logger item uh, later in this tutorial, but for now it's just important to, to note that if you want to log your data, and that is in most cases what you definitely want to do, you need to add a logger item usually to the end of the trial sequence. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of uh, step 5, and now we're going to move on to step 6, in which we're going to draw these sketch pads that we've defined uh, here. Okay, so let's close the file pool because it takes up a little bit of space. Okay, let's move to the fixation dot. So if you open the fixation dot or any kind of sketch pad, you will see that you get a you, you really have a graphical representation of your visual stimuli. So it's kind of like a paint a paint like uh, functionality to really draw your visual stimuli. And this is one of the powerful features of Open Sesame, I think. Um, by default, Open Sesame uses uh, a dark background and a white foreground, which I think is fine because it avoids uh, eye, eye strain. But we are actually, if you're looking, if you look, if you switch to to our uh, to our gaze neutral thing, you see that they actually have a white background. So that will look a bit weird on the on the black background. So we're going to change this. To do that, we're going to make a, uh, a slight detour. We're going to open the general tab which you can do by clicking on the top level item in the overview area, which is called new experiment. And here you have a whole bunch of options that are that are kind of like general options of your experiment. You have a name, obviously. The default name is called new, is new experiment. So let's call it video tutorial. Huh? Maybe a description. So, uh, this is my example, gaze queuing experiment, whatever. Okay. Then we have the backend. Um, the backend is the low-level layer that de that determines. Uh, well, it's the kind of it specifies the way that visual stimuli are shown on the display. This is quite important, and uh, I suggest, uh, especially if you're interested in doing time-critical experiments, that you read the the, the backend section and the and the timing section on the documentation side. Uh, for our purpose. What we're going to do is we're just going to switch to uh, the backend called Legacy, not because it's a particularly good backend, but because it works uh, better with the screen uh, recording software that I'm using uh, right now. Okay, then we have the resolution 1024 by 768, so just kind of standard resolution. The colors, the foreground is white. We're going to change the foreground to black, and the background is black. We're going to change the background to white. We can use a lot of different ways to uh, to specify uh, colors. We can say, for example, okay, instead of white, we can say F F F F F F, uh, which also means uh, means white, but then in hexadecimal notation. Uh, we can write, we can uh, use uh, uh, RGB notation, say 100 percent, 100 percent red, 0 percent green, and 0 percent. Oh, okay. Yep typed accidentally pressed enter RGB 100% 0% 0% so that would that would mean 100% uh, red 0% green 0% blue okay so there are a few different ways in which you can specify uh, uh, colors uh, in most cases words are just the most readable right so we're just going to say background white okay now this is the end of our little detour let's switch back to uh, to our fixation dot Click on it, and we're going to draw. We're going to draw a fixation dot in the center of the screen because fixation dots are so common in uh, psychology research. There is actually a special fixation dot element here. I'm going to select it. Right. We also have text line for drawing text, a line, arrow, rectangle, circle, ellipse, images, Gabor patches, noise patches. But now we're going to use the fixation dot. We're the color is still set to white, so we're going to change it to black. Up, and we draw it in the center of the screen. Now, that is basically what we all we need to do for our, uh, our fixation dot, but we also need to change the duration. You see that by default the duration is set to key press, 
which means that this fixation dot will stay on the screen until the user presses the participant presses a key. This is that is not what we want, right? We want the trial sequence to automatically progress uh, over time. So we're going to change this key press duration uh, to seven four five. Now, what does this mean? Seven four five means basically that the fixation dot will be shown for seven hundred and fifty milliseconds. It is we, the duration that we specified is uh, a little bit less than seven hundred and fifty milliseconds, right? But because uh, a stimuli has to be shown always uh, for a multiple of, of frame durations, right? Each frame usually on most monitors less 16.67 milliseconds. So a stimulus is always visible for a multiple of 16.67 milliseconds. Uh, and this value that we type right here is rounded up to the, to the nearest multiple of 16.67 milliseconds, which is 750. This sounds kind of complicated. It's not really that complicated. Uh, what you what you need to keep in mind as a general rule is that you want to select a duration that is possible, right? So a duration that is actually a multiple of your frame duration. And then you subtract, say, 5 milliseconds from that duration. So we wanted to go for 750, which is possible because it's a multiple of 16.67, and then we subtracted 5 milliseconds. Okay. Again, this is quite important, so if you're into uh, time-critical experiment, experiments, I suggest that you read the timing section uh, on the documentation website. Okay, so far for the fixation dot. Let's move on to the neutral gaze item. Okay. Um, the neutral gaze is this uh, is an image, right? So we're going to select the image element here, this one. We're going to click in the center of the screen, and we're going to select the gaze neutral uh, uh, bitmap and say select, and there it is. Okay, now following the same logic as before, we're going to change this to 745 if we want to change the duration to 745 if we want to show the 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 gaze Q the ga neutral gaze phase for 750 milliseconds. Uh, and that's it. Now we're going to move on to the gaze queue. And this is where things get uh, gradually get more interesting. Now, uh, the gaze queue is not always the same, right? So on some trials the gaze looks to the left, and on other trials the gaze looks to the right. So we cannot just draw uh, a fixed image on the, on the center of the screen. That won't work. Um, However, we can use a clever trick in Open Sesame, which goes as follows. We start by defining a uh, what you might call a prototype display, a display that might occur on a particular trial. So select the, text, the, the image element, click on the center, and select gaze left.png, right? Because on some trials, the gaze, the, the smiley looks to the left. Um, then, we're going to make use of the fact that everything that you do in a graphical user interface generates a script, a very simple script, which is called Open Sesame Script. This script is not generally visible, but you can make it visible by clicking here on the view icon. And now you can choose what you want to see, whether you want to see the controls, so those are the, the graphical things that we usually see, whether you want to see the script, or whether you want to see both. So we say split view, okay, there we are. And then you see that in the script that has been generated, there's this line in which we draw an image on the center of the screen and we draw it from the file gaze left.png. Now what we're going to do is basically we're going to replace this part left by between square brackets gaze queue. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, the square brackets indicate that gaze queue is the name of a variable, and when Open Sesame uh, when Open Sesame is going to run this experiment, it will run, it will show uh, gaze left dot png whenever gaze queue has the value left, and gaze right dot png whenever gaze queue has the value right. Okay, so it basically it makes it makes this static image that used to be static always to the left makes it variable and dependent on the variable gaze queue. So that's quite nice and convenient. 
Okay, so if we apply that, you see that the the, the, the smiley face changes into uh, into a, a question uh, into a question mark because Open Sesame now doesn't know how to uh, how to uh, how to how to give you a preview because it is variably defined. But that's okay; it will be actually be shown during the uh, the experiment. Okay. Now uh, we also have to change the duration, right? So we can change the duration here in the in the duration field, or we can change it here in the script. Boils down to the same thing. So let's do it in the script just uh, to vary a little bit. So we say 495. That means it's rounded up, right? Again, to the nearest nearest duration that is compatible with the frame duration, which is 500 milliseconds. So this means that the gaze cue will be shown for 500 milliseconds. Okay. Apply and close. Up. Oh. Okay. There we are. Now we're going to uh, now we're going to uh, go to the target item, and that's where things get even more interesting. Click on the target. So the target is to begin with the same as the gaze cue, right? Because uh, uh, because it has the it still has the gaze cue in it. Okay, so we start by drawing gaze left. Nope, oh, the mouse is a little bit funky. In addition to the uh, in addition to the gaze cue, there is the there is the target and the distractor letter, right? So we're going to draw the, those with the, the 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 letter with the text line element. You see, when I select the text line element, you see a few things options popping up that are compatible with uh, with, uh, with 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 text, right? That are applicable to text. By default, default we use a mono space font of 18 pixels. Um, I think 18 pixels is a bit small, so let's put it to 32 pixels. Okay, so if you click on the font, you see a few different fonts, mono space, sans serif, serif, and you also see a few fonts that are specific to non-Western uh, languages, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Hebrew, and Hindi. If you want to draw, for example, Arabic text, you have to select the Arabic font, because Open Sesame is not smart enough uh, to 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 select the correct f font itself, right? So, for example, if in Microsoft Word you type Arabic text, even though you've selected a font that doesn't support Arabic text, w Microsoft Wor Word will automatically select a font that does contain the Arabic characters. Open Sesame won't do that. So, if you add Arabic font to your di display while having, for example, the monospace font selected, will you will just see empty boxes uh, when running the experiment. Right, so that's why, if you if you are if you want to use Arabic text, select Arabic, CJK for Asian, Hebrew, and Hindi, Hindi, etc. Okay, now, so as I said, you can draw. We, you can start by we are going to start by drawing a prototype display as the display might look like on a given uh, given trial. So, for example, on some trials, the distractor, which is an X, might be on the left, right? Uh, and then, obviously, the target will be on the right. So, up. Now, instead of typing the target letter directly, we're going to make use of the fact that we have a variable called target letter, and we're going to put it between square brackets to indicate that we target letter is the name of a variable. And if we do that, Open Sesame will not show while you're running the experiment will not show uh, between square brackets target letter, but it will show F when target letter is F and H when target letter is H, right? Okay, now, uh, and then we're going to use, so now we have to find a static display, right? A prototype display of what the target display might look like on a given trial. And what we're going to do is we're going to view the script just like before, and we're going to make it variable, okay? So just like with gaze queue, with the gaze queue, we're going to replace this gaze left by gaze underscore gaze queue dot png, right? So that basically assures that our gaze queue depends on the variable gaze queue. Here we have this line right here corresponds to our distractor, right? It has the text x in it. And right now it's on the fixed location minus 320, so on the left. What we're going to do is we're going to replace this fixed location by this pos between square brackets so that the x coordinate of the distractor de depends on the variable this pos. Once we do that, 
the Open Sesame will say that it doesn't no longer knows where to uh, show this pulse, but that doesn't matter. Uh, it will be shown during the experiment. And we're going to do the same trick for target letter, right? We're going to replace the x, uh, the x coordinate by, uh, which used to be 320. We're going to replace it by between square bracket target pulse. Okay, and then we're going to say apply and close. Okay, now, um, a last thing that we need to do when uh, before we move on to uh, the keyboard response is to specify the duration of the target. Now, by default, is the duration is key press, which at first sight may may make sense for the for the for the target, right? Because we want the target to be visible until uh, the participant presses a key. But actually, we're going to change it to zero which might not make sense because we don't want the target to be visible for zero milliseconds, right? But what this actually means if we set the duration to zero is that once the experiment, once Open Sesame has shown the target, it will not wait at all. It will move on immediately to the next item, which is the keyboard response. And this will collect a keyboard a, a response to the target, right? So basically, this duration of zero milliseconds means that Open Sesame should not wait before moving on to the keyboard response to collect the keyboard response. Okay. So that's the logic behind it. Okay, now we're advancing uh, nicely. Uh, this was the end already of uh, of step six. Now we're going to move on to step seven in which we're going to configure the keyboard response item so we're going to click on the keyboard response item and this is actually quite simple so the keyboard response has a few uh, few options there's the correct response field which is empty and that's fine if we leave this correct response field empty open sesame will automatically use the variable that we've created which is called correct underscore response right so leaving it empty is the same as saying okay use correct re underscore response um, then we have the allowed responses field, which is a, s a semicolon separated list of keys that should be uh, allowed. And it's, we, we have the Z and the M, right? Because the Z is for the F and the M is for the H. In addition to the Z and the M, Open Sesame will also always respond to the, the key escape, which will pause the experiment, right? So that's always implied. Okay, then we have a timeout value, which, which specifies after how many milliseconds Open Sesame should move on to, uh, to, uh, to should basically should consider that no response is going to come in, and then it will set the, the response variable to none with the, with the capital N. So we set this to 2000, which means that the participants have to respond within two seconds, which I think is plenty for this kind of simple task. Okay. Then we have this option here, flush pending key presses. Basically, if you have this enabled, and usually you want to have this enabled, it means that opens that that all responses that were still pending, right? So if the participant had pressed r some keys before this keyboard response item became activated, are flushed and ignored, and only new responses will be accepted. So that's usually what you want. Only in very rare cases uh, do you want to disable that option. Okay, that brings us to the end of step 7. Now we're going to move on to step 8, in which we're going to configure the incorrect sound item for the sampler. Right? So we're going to click on it to open it, and actually we don't hardly need to do anything here. We just need to select the sound file, click on browse, okay, select the incorrect.ogg, select. Uh, and basically that's fine. You can see we can take a look at a few of the options, right? This is the volume, the panning, so left or right, the pitch, so the speed of the sound. Uh, stop after, so that indicates, for example, if you put this at 100, it means that the sound is stopped after 100 milliseconds, so it's truncated. Fade in means that the sound is fades in for an x, x number of milliseconds, and duration means the 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 time that the the sampler item pauses the experiment. So if it's set to sound. Basically, Open Sesame will not move on to the next item until uh, the sound is finished playing. If you would set the duration to zero, it wouldn't mean that the sound is played for only zero milliseconds, but that Open Sesame just moves on immediately to the next item uh, while the sound is still playing in the background. Okay, well, that's the end of step eight. 
So let's move on to step 9, in which we're going to configure the logger, which does the data logging. So I'm going to click on the logger. Actually, um, we don't really need to do anything in logger, but because it's very important, we're still going to take a look at it. So you see that here, the option log all variables is selected by default. This means that Open Sesame will automatically check which experimental variables it knows about and log all of them. That's a lot of variables, so you will have a very big log file. Uh, but I still think it's usually the safest option because it's better to have too much data than to have too little data, right? Um, also, even if you have the log all variables option enabled, you still need to double and triple check that all the data that you need for your analysis is actually actually visible pr present in your data files, right? Because you won't be the first uh, first researcher that runs 100 participants only to find out that the response uh, was not logged, for example. Of course, Open Sesame does everything in its power to avoid that from happening, but uh, you want to err on the side of caution, as they say. Now, let's assume for uh, for a moment that you don't want to log all variables. Then you can disable this, and then you can add a custom variable by saying OK. Click on Add Custom Variable Response. Another way to add variables is by activating the Variable Inspector and dragging variables from here into the experiment, for example, into the logger item, for example, drag the correct item up into here, right? Uh, well, so you can do that, but it's not usually recommended unless you, you really know why, and uh, in this case we're just going to log all variables. Okay, that is the end of step 9. Now we're going to move on to step 10, in which we're going to define the per block feedback. So we're going to click on the feedback item right here. Um, and basically feedback is quite simple. We just se select the text, up, we click in the center of the screen, and we say, okay, for example, uh, you can be a bit creative here, but say end of block. Um, your average response time was average RT dot milliseconds your accuracy was ac percent press any key to continue okay now what does this mean so okay um, it's a bit small I think so let's put this at 32 for example so what does this mean well most of it is clear I guess but uh, basically open sesame automatically keeps track of the average response time and your accuracy. And these are stored in the variables average underscore RT and ACK. So what we're doing here by putting these between square brackets is basically telling Open Sesame to show the average response time here and then followed by milliseconds and the accuracy here followed by a percentage time uh, percentage sign. Right? So that's quite uh, convenient. The duration is key press, which is fine because I, I guess it makes sense to have the participants to, to give the participants a break until they press a key to move on to the next uh, next block, right? Okay, um, so that's the end of step 10. Um, now we're going to move on to step 11 in, t in which we're going to specify the length of our various uh, of our various uh, blocks and uh, phases. Now let's start by clicking on the block loop. So what you see here is that we have eight cycles, so basically we have eight different kinds of trials, right, executed in random order, uh, and each of them is executed only once. This means that, uh, basically this means that a block of trials is only eight trials, which is not that much. I think a more reasonable number of trials per block is, for example, 24. So if we s change the repeat value to 3, you will see that the block loop will now call trial sequence 8 times 3 is 24 times in random order. So we have a block of 24 trials. If we move up in the hierarchy, we go to practice loop, click on it. You see that practice loop calls block sequence only one time. This means that, that the practice phase consists of only one block of trials. Say that we want to have two practice blocks, we can change the, the, the repeat value to 2, up, like this, and then we have 
1 times 2, uh, 1 times 2 is 2 times uh, is block sequence called during the practice rule. Okay, so we have two, two practice blocks of 24 trials. The same logic uh, goes for the experimental loop. Uh, now, I think a reasonable number of trials for the for an experimental phase is eight uh, blocks for an experimental phase is eight. If we put this to eight, you see that during the experimental loop, block sequence will be will be called eight times. That means that our experiment will consist of eight blocks of 24 trials, okay? which is fine. Uh, a nice trick, I think, for data analysis, and that's actually what I usually do, is that I add a variable to the experimental loop, which is practice no. Right, so if you define a new variable, you can say the name of the variable, sp space, and then the default uh, value. Up, no. Okay, practice no. And in the practice loop, we say practice yes. This does nothing in our experiment. Right? But it makes it easier during data analysis because we can automatically filter out all trials where practice is yes. Okay? So it always makes sense, I think, to, to think of your data analysis already while you're designing your experiment because it can save you uh, a lot of headaches. Okay, well, that was the end of, uh, of uh, step 11. Now we're moving on to step 12 in which we're going to uh, write the instructions the end of practice and the end of experiment messages. Well, that's, let's do, just do that really quickly, because uh, just to, for the sake of time. But obviously, instructions are a very important aspect of your experiment, so you should really think very carefully on how to frame your uh, your instructions so that the pr participant understands. Preferably using a bullet point kind of uh, bullet point kind of structure, and without having too much information on the screen at any one time. Those are, I think, uh, the golden rules for having a clear instructions uh, display or having a s multiple instructions displays if, you're, uh, if your instructions are kind of complicated. Okay, so let's say okay. instructions. Okay, so let's just keep it really short. Say, if you see an F, press M. If you see uh, H press slash slash right. Okay, okay. We're going to the end of practice message, which is more or less the same. End of practice. You see, by the way, that these the title of the form has these weird things around it. Span size twenty four. These are so called HTML tags. Um, that allow you to kind of uh, adjust the layout of your uh, of your of your letters. For example, this means that all the things, all the text that is within this span has to, has has a size of 24, which is a little bit bigger than usual. Um, and this is a flexible way to 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 add some uh, text formatting to your experiment. So you can take a look at the the text uh, page on the documentation side to to find out how that works. But basically, it works like a sort of simplified uh, HTML. Okay, uh, the practice phase is finished. Finished. Okay. Of, of course, in real life you have to explain this a little bit so that participants understand what the difference between the practice phase and the experimental phase is. End of experiment. Okay, the experiment is finished. Up. Oh. Is finished. Okay. Now there we there we are. This is the, the 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 this is the end of step 12 and step 13 is running the experiment. Now before we're going to do that, we're going to do something that is super important, namely saving our experiment. I click on the save button. Right, I've been working quite some time uh, and without saving at all. That is not. Uh, not really good practice. I think I would recommend saving your experiment quite often so that you uh, don't lose anything if your computer crashes or whatever disaster or catastrophe uh, uh, occurs. Okay, uh, well, it automatically suggests a name video tutorial.osexp.osexp is the default uh, uh, file extension of OpenSesame as of OpenSesame 3.0. Okay, that's fine. Save. Okay, now we're totally good to go. Now we can run our experiment. We can do this in three ways. We can click on the Run Full Screen button. Uh, 
which runs, which is basically what you would do if you would run the 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 the, the experiment in real life, right, with real participants. Um, we can run it in a window, um, or we can do a quick run. A quick run is the same as running in a window. The only difference is that it bypasses a few questions, like asking uh, for the subject number. So it's quite convenient during debugging. Uh, but here, what we're going to do is run it in a window, so you can see what that uh, looks like. What we're also going to do is we're going to show the variable inspector. So I'm going to click on this because the variable inspector uh, gives a live overview of the values that certain variables have. Right. So say, for example, uh, here we have the correct variable, which depends obviously on a response. If we run the experiment, you will see this correct variable uh, switching from zero to one, etc., depending on whether I give a correct response. Okay, so that's very convenient during debugging. It also, for example, allows you to see whether the conditions that you see uh, defined here in your variable inspector match the behavior of your experiment. Okay, so let's click on Run in Window, enter subject number zero. That's fine. S select uh, save uh, the, the data file somewhere. So Open Sesame uses comma separated values uh, files, which are spreadsheet text text-based spreadsheets that you can just open in Excel or LibreOffice or whatever kind of uh, uh, spreadsheet software you use. Excel sometimes opens it in a little bit of a funny way, but uh, you can, uh, if you Google it a little bit, you will find out how to open it. Okay, save. There we go. We have our instruction screen, right? So we'll move it a little bit to the to the left so we can see it. So we can see the correct uh, variable here. Okay, and there we go. Okay, we have the smiley face. I see an F, so Z so is correct, right? So correct becomes 1. Z. Now I'm going to make a mistake. Z again. I hear a sound and correct becomes 0. Up. If I don't respond, it will time out after 2 seconds. Okay, well, that's it. Thank you very much for uh, for following this uh, gaze tutorial and bearing, uh, bearing with me. Um, you can find out much more about Open Sesame on the documentation site, including other tutorials, more complicated tutorials that include uh, Python code, etc. So uh, I would definitely recommend uh, checking those out. And if you have any questions, don't ha uh, don't hesitate to to uh, to ask them on the support forum, uh, where you will be uh, helped uh, very quickly, usually by uh, one of the community uh, members. Thank you very much.